Hello everyone, welcome and welcome back to my channel, I'm in. Today I want to tell you about a serial killer who got away with a bunch of murders, even though there was plenty of evidence against him. This dude was ruthless and sly, and I think one of the reasons he wasn't caught sooner was because of this um, serious gender inequality and family issues going on in society back then. But hey, I shouldn't jump to conclusions before laying out the whole story. You might end up with a totally different take after hearing everything that went down. So let's just dive right in and get to today's story, shall we? It was the end of 2001. Inside a residential building in Shanghai, the echoes of two men arguing filled the air. A young man shouted, Did you kill my mom? The older man across from him looked bewildered. What nonsense are you talking about? The young lad sneered. Who else but you? The older one got furious. It's you! The atmosphere between them was intense as if they wanted to send each other's jade to jail. Surprisingly, these two individuals shared a deep-seated hatred. Yet, they are father and son. What could have happened in this family to drive father and son to accuse each other of being a murderer. In fact, a major incident occurred just a few months before this hated confrontation. It was in the afternoon on the 6th of April 2001. Taylor, a final year student, had recently finished his school and was relaxing at a friend's place, playing games. At 3.40pm, he received a call from his father at home. Feeling a bit annoyed, Taylor thought, What time is it? Why is it urging me to come home? He reluctantly paused the game and impatiently answered the phone. On the other end, his father's voice trembled with panic. Terry back, your mom. Something horrible happened to her. Hearing this, Taylor's heart sank. His mother had a weak heart. Could it be that she fell ill in the afternoon when no one was around? He hesitantly rushed back. Little did he know, the situation was far more serious than a heart attack. When Taylor arrived at the neighborhood, he not only saw an ambulance, but also noticed the presence of the police. A crowd of curious neighbors gathered downstairs, whispering about phrases like, murders, and no escapes. At this point, while he could have some thoughts about his mother's fate, he still didn't want to believe it. So he went up to the second floor as if he was in a dream. Upon reaching home, he found the front door wide open with several police officers in uniform inside. Before Taylor could catch his breath, he was informed his mother was dead, murdered. His mind went blank in an instant. Reality hit Taylor and his father like a heavy hammer. A single afternoon out and their home was gone. Taylor's father had finished work early that day. Upon returning home, he discovered his wife lying lifeless in bed. After calling the police, the officers swiftly arrived to investigate. When the police arrived, the head detective found the crime scene was extremely unusual. Why? It was too clean. Clean, as in there was no sign of fights. The door lock and windows were not pried or damaged, and the female victim was lying on the bed right? You'd expect it's a case with sexual violation. But nope, the victim had all her clothes on. She looked like she was killed by someone she knew and she didn't see it coming. And the way things went down, you could tell the killer was ruthless. The crime scene was in the bathroom and the body was lying face down. The cause of death is mechanical asphyxiation. In another words, strangled. 
and she was dead of two neck ties. What's weird is that one of the ties got snapped in half during the struggle. The killer, though, wasted no time and grabbed another one from the closet. Kept going until the victim couldn't breathe. It's clear the killer was cold-blooded, with a very specific target in mind. No hesitation, not a moment of doubt throughout this whole process. And these ties were lying at the crime scene as if the perpetrator didn't even care to hide his crimes. And from the victim's body with marks of her being violated pressed down. The way the murder went down made it pretty clear that the perp was a guy. But here's the twist. That's throwing the cops off. The female victim seemed to have a lot of respect to this killer. Why? While in the living room right there on display was a fancy porcelain teacup, like the ones you'd use to welcome an owner guest. The cup has some top-notch tea from that year, not the usual aged tea they drink at home. Back in those days, if someone served you tea like that, you knew they had some status in society. Plus, when the lady of the house brings out the stuff, it's definitely someone important. Maybe it's her boss or, you know, an elder, because we are in this patriarchic society here in China. But here's the kicker. Why did the victim have respect for this person while the other had so much hatred towards her? When the cops tried to dust for fingerprints, they found they were all wiped out. Seems like this person knows a thing or two about avoiding detection. So summing up, the killer's profile looks like this. He was someone the victim respected. He killed with brutal methods. He was skewed at avoiding leaving behind his fingerprints. From the first conclusion in which the victim should know the perp, and combined with the rest, the police thought they could quickly nail the culprit, right? That the, the range of search shouldn't be large. But reality is not playing along. The cops took a good look at all these details and found some contradictions in between. The pub had skills and was ruthless, so he probably had a rap sheet. Now, why would someone with a criminal record be treated with respect by the lady of the house? That doesn't make sense, right? The victim was rich, so money or romance might be motives. But the crime scene indicated neither robbery or passion killing. Family did construction business at the time, so they were really loaded. In an era where even a millionaire was a big deal, the victim's family's jewelry was casually left in drawers and gold breaks out in the open in the bedroom's safe vault. It's practically like back in killer. Look here, here, see, I am valuable. But the drawer showed no signs of being opened, nothing inside was touched. Not a single piece of easily grabbed jewelry was missing. The safe at the crime scene was untouched, no signs of tampering either. Robbery was rolled out. In the forensic examination, besides the strangulation marks on the neck, the victim's wrists were bound, but her clothes were intact and there was no evidence of a sexual assault. Last four motives were also ruled out. The two most likely motives were a no-go. The cops then investigated the social circles of the victims and her husband, looking into whether it could be a revenge or anything useful. But soon the results showed. Nope. None of the husband's business partners had a family's address or phone number. Potential romantic interests of the victim had alibis for the time of the crime. The police turned the town upside down, checking anything remotely connected to the victim. Around a hundred people, and then eventually wrote them all out. The killer's identity and motive remained a mystery. 
It was an era without surveillance cameras and limited DNA testing abilities. While in recent years DNA testing has stepped up its game big time, we are discussing fast sequencing, gene editing, and exploring the use of machine learning and AI for in-depth data analysis. Compared to the 2000s, it's all about better precision, efficiency, and covering all the bases. So when we look back to the case, without a clear motive, serving the case was like looking for a needle in a haystack. Therefore, the case hung in limbo for a year. The relationship between the father and son, you know, Taylor and his pap, hit a deadlock as the case stalled. Both of them had their share of suspicions. For all you true crime fans out there, you probably know the drill. It's always the husbands, right? When there's no other suspect in sight, pointing fingers at Harvey is kind of the um, default mode. And guess what? The neighbor's testimony wasn't doing the victim's husbands any favors. At around 1.30 p.m. on the day of the incident, the neighbor downstairs heard a knock on the victim's door. After the victim responded, the guy outside just said, It's me, and she let him in. That it's me was in Shanghai accent. The lady didn't bother checking the identity, you know, local accent. Who else could it be other than her hubby? Plus, the husband could easily set up the scene by brewing tea. That's why these valuables had a reason to be untouched. Even though he claimed he got home at 3.30 p.m., his son, Taylor, found that quite suspicious. His dad had never ever come home that early. He usually wrapping up business meetings late into the night. His father explained that he needed to grab some cash, you know, to sign some contracts. Big deals since he was in this construction business back then. Taylor wasn't buying it, even though the family's income come from his dad, it was the mom who held the financial reins. Dad had been holding a garage over this for a while. Maybe it was a money dispute and he decided to take matters into his own hands. Initially, it was just fleeting suspicions, but Taylor soon began to uncover that he believed to be concrete evidence. Less than a year after his mother's death, his dad married a younger, pretty stepmom. Every time he visited his mother's grave, his dad always had these awkward expressions, like he felt guilty. So Taylor firmly believed his dad was the guilty party. But his dad had an alibi. Witnesses could vouch for him being somewhere else during the crime. The security guard of their family place even confirmed he returned to the neighborhood at 3.30 p.m. It's like alibis times alibi. The father wasn't the killer. Meanwhile, his father was also thinking about Taylor at the time. Taylor had just graduated from this um, high school, lazing around at home, constantly asking his mom for money to play games. In his rebellious teenage phase, Taylor and his mom often argued. His dad suspected Taylor, thinking he might have killed his mom due to some murder and some quarrels, and he believed he had evidence. On the day of the incident, Taylor did something really strange. He took his mother's mobile phone when he left. Coincidence? The father didn't think so. He was convinced Taylor did it to cut off his mother's contact with the outside world, making it impossible for her to call for help. They even had a full-on heart-to-heart father-son talk, a real showdown. With the mother gone, it was just the father and son left relying on each other. They were the least people who wanted to believe that the other was the killer. But suspicion is like a paint stain on a glass window. You know it wasn't a smudge, but it still makes you cringe. 
The two of them couldn't help but repeatedly record each other's actions during that day, trying to find any slips ups. The neighbor's testimony, the Shanghai accent, um, this "it's me," was what made Taylor doubt his own father. So Taylor started to looping everything around that time of his mother's death. Suddenly, recall that he received a phone call the day before the incident when he was at home. The caller also had a Shanghai accent, and that person wasn't his dad. Thinking back now, that phone call seemed extremely suspicious. The caller was a man, and his first question was. Is Taylor home? Taylor replied, "Yeah, what's up?" If it was really about finding Taylor, the caller could have just stated his purpose, right? However, he took a different turn and asked, "Is your father at home?" At that time, his father wasn't home. When he asked that question, this person on the phone directly mentioned his father's full name. So Taylor assumed it might be someone his father knew from business, and said, "He's not home. Why don't you just call his mobile number?" Uh, oh well, it's all right. And the guy on the other end quickly hung up. Taylor asked his father later, "Did you receive that person's call later?" After recalling, his father was sure he had never ever received. Any calls from anyone around that time? Both quickly provided this information to the police. Upon hearing Taylor's reported conversation, the police instantly knew it. The caller's intention was to figure out who was at home. The person who called was likely the killer. The suspect seemed to have some online now. This person not only had Taylor's home address and family phone number, but also Knew Taylor's father's name like the back of his hand. What's chilling is that this call was made from a public phone booth, just one kilometer away from Taylor's home. The first person he inquired about was Taylor himself. The police had no choice but to focus on Taylor as the central figure in this case. At this point, the police thought in what specific case in which Taylor. Or he, any of his family members would willingly give out their family details, you know, phone number, address, parents' information. The police had a light bulb moment. You only give such details to school. So they shifted their attention to the high school Taylor attended. However, even after checking the school, they couldn't find a suspect matching the characteristics. This new lead also led to nothing. Just when the police were at a loss, another case occurred. The victim was a classmate of Taylor's, Kathy. Another person is dead. This news shocked all the classmates in the class. The victim was Kathy. According to the classmates, Kathy's family was all about art. So Kathy naturally had a particularly outstanding temperament and was very popular in the class. If Taylor's encounter was just an accident, Kathy's death is a blow and a deterrent to the whole class. First, they felt sad for Kathy. Second, they were afraid. It's like that curse. Would it be their turn the next time? As the investigation continued, similarities between Kathy's case and the murder of Taylor's mom came to light. Before both cases occurred, they both received a mysterious phone call. On the first of July, two thousand and two, around eleven a.m., Kathy's mom received a call. At that time, Kathy, after graduating from the high school, was preparing for the adult college entrance exam. Apart from eating and sleeping, she basically stayed in the、um, coaching class every single day. A stranger called, looking for her. Initially, Kathy's mom was a bit cautious. However, the man on the phone sounded like he was already in his forties, with a gentle and steady voice, and a 
refined tone. His voice made people lower their guard. He didn't need to say much for Cathy's mom to assume that he might be a teacher, possibly in a subject related to her daughter's study. At that time, Cathy was in a lecture. One of Cathy's older family member was in the hospital, and Cathy's mom was rushing to bring food. The mother worried that she wouldn't be able to talk about school stuff on the phone, and that might slow Cathy's studies. The mother truthfully informed that person on the other end, saying, "She's not here right now." Before hanging up, she added a sentence that will haunt her for the rest of her life. She said, "I'm rushing out. Kathy will be back soon for lunch. Just find her directly." Kathy's mother didn't realize that this phone call exposed two crucial pieces of information. One. Kathy is returning home. Two, there were no other people at home. By two p.m., after Kathy's mom came home from the hospital, she saw that her daughter's school backpack was still hanging behind the door instead of being taken to the class. And it looked like her daughter didn't even change her shoes to go out. Glancing around, she realized that at this hour, her daughter was still lying lazily. In bed, this kid was slacking off. After urging her a few times, she still didn't hear the response from her daughter. She finally felt like there was something off. So the mother promptly went into her daughter's room, but when she opened the door, she discovered the nightmare of her life. Her daughter was lying on the bed. But her clothes and the bedding were all tangled together. But that wasn't the worst yet. She noticed that her daughter was lying in bed with a really weird position. Her limbs were twisted to very unnatural positions. The mother literally had an empty head the moment she discovered her baby like this. She didn't know if a century had passed until she was struck as if by lightning, trembling. As she checked her daughter's breath, pulse, and heartbeat, nothing remained in her. She was dead. Her lively daughter from the morning, who had come home for lunch, was now a stiff corpse. What happened within this hour in between? She left her home and arrived home. When the police arrived at the crime scene. Kathy's mom's voice was already hoarse from crying, unable to utter a word. The more the police investigated, the more they felt an unspeakable familiarity. There were no signs of the door being forced open or damaged. Kathy likely willingly opened the door for the assailant, and there were signs of entertaining guests in the living room. Upon checking with Kathy's parents. Nothing was missing from the house. The investigating officers suddenly realized this case was identical to the previous murder of Taylor's mother. Coupled with Taylor being in the same class, the police believed that both cases were the work of the same perpetrator. Compared to the previous incident, the perpetrator was more experienced and skilled this time. As the crime scene of this. Murder of Kathy. It was noticeably cleaned up. Not what the police know about the cases. The assailant must be a Shanghai local who knew in details about both Taylor and Kathy's family's information. Moreover, he could easily gain the trust and respect of both children and parents. Plus, it is a known factor that all the students would give their detailed family information to the school. So, what would you think would have contacted this information? The class teacher Adam, who spoke a Shanghai dialect, holding student registration forms, and a middle-aged man. Actually, during Taylor's mother's case, the police had investigated Adam and found that he had solid alibi for the crime. Moreover, Taylor was the class representative before graduating. And was highly regarded by Adam.
and Adam also lacked a motive for the crime. Furthermore, the voice Taylor heard on the phone call wasn't Adam's. You know, Taylor is familiar with Adam. He would know instantly if that caller was Adam. Therefore, Adam was ruled out as a suspect from the beginning. But when the murder took place, people had often connected Adam with the terms of negligence and related to the case. Despite his repeated assurances that the student registration forms were always locked in his office desk and were never ever leaked or lost, no one believed him. Rumors spread among students, and parents were hesitant to entrust their children to him. Some colleagues, being repeatedly investigated by the police, felt that Adam had implicated everyone. It's annoying enough to go to work, you know, and how everyone was gossiping and suspecting him. But for the sake of livelihood, Adam couldn't resign. He hoped every day for the police to solve the case sooner and clear his name. Instead of being proven innocent, he got even more caught up in the situation in the past year. Fortunately, the police were swift in their investigation. Just when Adam was about to be drowned in rumors, there was a major breakthrough in the case. There was a witness for Kathy's case. According to Kathy's family phone records, the police found a grocery store where the suspect had called Kathy's family from. The grocery store was six kilometers away from Kathy's home, and Belle was the owner. On the day of the call, the weather was bad, raining all the time, with very few people on the streets. Number of people who borrowed a phone at a grocery store was extremely limited. During that time, there was only one person, the perpetrator, had used the phone from the grocery store. After making the call, he didn't pay. Bill had to stop him, asking for payment. The man reluctantly took out a fifty-cent coin and gave Bill a fierce look. As a result. She remembered this guy vividly. The suspect was male with dark skin, a slender figure, and some sunken cheeks. He was around 1.7 meters tall and looked to be in his 40s. The estimated age matched impression from Kathy's mom from the phone call. The police then created a sketch based on this description from Bell. After merging the two cases, it seemed like the police were getting closer to catching the culprit. The whole class knew detailed information about each other's families, and the killer wasn't the teacher. So, where did things go wrong? In the error, there was another thing that could also gather all this information together. A cop had a light bulb moment. Taylor and Kathy was in the graduating class, right? Those days, when graduation season arrived, classmates would carefully prepare a yearbook. It didn't just contain zodiac signs, hobbies, and best wishes. It often included detailed family information for each student. Could it be that this information leaked from the yearbook somehow? Please got to work. Classmates were checked, fathers were investigated, all the teachers underwent scrutiny, with male teachers directly questioned, and female teachers got their spouse checked. Everyone was thoroughly examined, but surprisingly, each person was ruled out. At this point, the case still had no progress. Therefore, the police had to hold a special class meeting, questioning each person, asking if anyone had lost their yearbook. The worst case scenario was that one of those yearbook was lost, and the killer found it right in the vast city of Shanghai. Finding a lost yearbook seemed like a mission impossible. The police was already decided to 
start their search if that was the case. But fortune favored the persistent. During the class meeting, Ava's mom saw this and simulated sketch of the suspect and exclaimed, "Is he him? I've seen him. He visited my home." Facing the shocked eyes of the police, she stood, stunned for a while before regaining her composure, saying with a lingering fear, "I might have been almost cute." That was before Kathy was murdered. In the afternoon of the twenty-fourth of April, two thousand and two, a stranger knocked on Ava's door. The man wore square glasses, a wool sweater with a round neckline, and a sea green suit on top. He looked like a teacher. Two hours earlier, he had called Ava's home, and Ava's mom answered the phone. In the call, he claimed to be a teacher from the school. Replacing the sick teacher Adam for a home visit, since he accurately mentioned Adam and the family members' names over the phone, Eva's mom had no reason to be suspicious, right? Not long after the call, he visited in person. A quick note here: Eva's home consists of two units on the sixth floor, connected each other with a main door in the room six o one. However, the teacher seemed unaware and headed to the usually closed room six o two. Ava's mom didn't think much of it and warmly welcomed the teacher into their home. The teacher claimed the home visit was to understand the students' employment situations after graduation. Once inside, Ava's mom felt something was off. Instead of Talking about the child, the visitor was more interested in their privacy. Is there anyone else at home? Eva's mom didn't answer because she noticed the man's gaze was fixed on a closed room door within her place. Right, seeing her silence, he directly asked, "What's behind that door?" Eva's mom, trusting her instincts, chose not to answer. Is that? She said, "Got to the point, please." Surprisingly, the man stood up and tried to open that door directly. Ava's mom had no idea that the murderer was checking if there was anyone else in the house. She just feeling really offended, so she stopped him, yelled at him, "What are you doing?" The man's reaction was even stranger. Once abstracted, the home visit abruptly ended. After some vague excuses, he left, seemingly afraid of something. Ava's mom grew more uneasy, quickly calling Adam, the class teacher. Adam was baffled. He wasn't sick, and there was no plan for any of these supposedly home visits at all. Despite the odd situation, there was no actual harm or anything seriously happened. So Ava's mom didn't really report it to the police. If it weren't for the police bring up the sketch during the parent meeting, she would have almost forgotten about it. Now she felt incredibly relieved. She encountered the serial killer. At that time, she was alone at home. If that man had ever opened that door, she might have fallen victim herself. It was mom who narrowly escaped death. Under the intense shock, provided the police with details about her place. You know, explained the differences of her home, about this room six o one and six o two. The police quickly verified and found out that Ava had written down six o two in this class yearbook. Hence, why the killer went knocking to the rarely used door of six o two. Now it's confirmed. The killer obtained student information based on this particular class yearbook. Before each kill, he would make a confirming call to check the number of people at home. That class yearbook, filled with warm wishes, suddenly turns into a death list. Panic swept through the families of over fifty students, with some parents even moving their homes overnight. 
the serial killer with an unknown motive forced the police to take extra care to the case. After visiting all the families, the police discovered none of these class yearbooks were missing. So everyone who had access to this yearbook, one after another, was listed for interrogation. There were over 400 people in total. The police worked tirelessly to investigate, but they ended up in despair. There wasn't a single suspect who met the criteria. Where did things go wrong again? The fact that Ava's mom could recognize the killer based on the sketch indicated that the image was clear enough. The killer didn't take away the yearbooks, but still knew the information inside. He must be someone with close ties to any of these students' families. However, no matter how the police investigated, they couldn't find a suspect. It was like searching for a needle in a haystack. I used this metaphor twice, I know, in this video. And despite the efforts, they came up empty-handed. It seemed that the intense police investigation had scared off the killer, who vanished without committing any more crimes. Many years later, the murderer remained at large, while the homes of Taylor and Kathy lay in ruins. The strained relationship between Taylor and his father persisted due to the suspicion surrounding the death of Taylor's mother. This tension endured even when Taylor's father felt seriously ill. Taylor's inner turmoil remained a silent burden, to the extent that he couldn't even bring himself to discuss the matter of his mother's death with his wife. Kathy's family faced an even more challenging situation. With a single sentence over the phone, they lost their only daughter. And it's easy to imagine that Kathy's mom lived the rest of her life burdened by self-blame. Her daughter's death took a toll on her health, confining her to bed for several years. Kathy's father too struggled with the blame directed at both his wife and himself. Despite selling the house after their beloved daughter died, the emotional wounds remained unhealed. As for Adam, he was buried again by the rumors and blames since the police had never caught the culprit. He was brought to face discussions and suspicions from students, parents, friends, and even netizens. Without a capture of the murderer, he couldn't shake off the speculations, rumors, and even defamation. In 2015, Taylor's father passed away, and Kathy's parents also succumbed to their grief. They died without even knowing who killed their loved ones. At this point, five more years would pass before the truth could be revealed. In 2020, Almost two decades had elapsed since the murder of Taylor's mother. Many believed this case would remain an eternal mystery. However, the Shanghai police hadn't forgotten about it. Simultaneously, advancements in forensic technology were on the way. While reviewing old cases, the police, relying on the latest DNA extraction technology, found a clue on the evidence from the crime scene of Taylor's mother's death, the band used to tie the victim. On the band, on this particular tie or band, the police detected this tiny, teeny biological information that matched the suspected killer. While they couldn't achieve the identification back then with this tiny, um, small amount of bios, armed with this new lead, the police began re-examining the case. Adam was the first to undergo a blood test, something he welcomed eagerly. His urgency matched that of the police and the family members. The results confirmed that neither Adam or Taylor or his father were the suspects. It's that it was an unknown male, a stranger. This time, the police expanded the comparison range 
to include family members of students and all school staff, totaling 421 people. This included hundreds of all male and female teachers and male relatives of janitors and students. Most of the respondents were cooperative, except for one person. In March 2021, when the police investigated a girl named Emma in a class, her father seemed extremely impatient. We've been divorced for decades. Why do you keep bothering me instead of looking for that guy she left with? Once Emma's father calmed down, he reluctantly explained why he was upset. Emma's parents had divorced in 1996, and he had been working in Singapore since then. He wasn't even in the country during the years of the crime. The police had known about a man who was living with Emma 20 years ago. But due to Emma and her mother's concealment, they didn't realize that that guy living with them wasn't Emma's biological father. Emma's father, who was abroad, was needlessly investigated multiple times by the police. He was rather frustrated by the situation. Emma's father provided more information about that man. His name was Yang Jianguo, and he was now 67 years old. The police quickly realized that Yang Jianguo could be the breakthrough in this case and promptly added him to the investigation list as suspect number 422. After the investigation, it turns out that this Yang Jianguo is indeed fishy. He's got a record of three previous crimes and has been freeloading off Emma's family. Plus, he is practically within arm's reach in Emma's yearbook. How come it took so long to figure this out? How did he slip through this door of screening of all family members from the police? Well, turns out Yang Jianguo never officially married Emma's mother. In those conservative times, a single woman living with a man other than her husband and raising a child together will be likely drowned in a sea of judgmental spit. So when the police were poking around, Emma and her mother deliberately kept their information under wraps. If it weren't for Ava's mom recognizing the suspect and Emma's father spilling the beans, who knows how long Yang Jianguo could have been hiding. Luckily, with today's DNA technology, we are just a step away from cracking the case. But right at this critical moment, the case hit another snag. In the early morning of the 15th of March 2021, the cops dumped into Yang Zhengguo's rented place, thinking they'd catch him off guard. Turns out it was the other way around. When the police arrived, the rented place was covered in blood. Yang Jianguo's scrawny body laid lifeless on the floor and his wrists were slashed deep enough to see the bones. He was already ice cold by the time the cops arrived. It's as if someone tipped him off, you know, the police were coming for you. Civilian footage showed that Yang Jianguo hadn't left his rental place for the past two days. Forensic analysis also confirmed that he was the one left biological chases at both crime scenes from two decades ago. This bizarre case spanning two decades involving four families and investigating over 400 people concluded with the suspect taking his own life. Yang Jianguo had been suffering from late-stage stomach cancer for years, making his suicide just an egg of fear from the cancer. Even though it was clear from the evidence in Taylor's mother's case that Yang Jianguo was the one who bonded the victim, he was never punished by the law. The motive behind the murders couldn't be verified and why he started it and why did he really stop. The investigators had to rely on his past experiences and others' descriptions to make educated guesses.
Yang Zhengguo and Charlotte were middle school classmates who knew each other early on. Back in middle school, Yang Zhengguo had a thing for Charlotte, but she wasn't interested in him at that time. They lost contact. Then Charlotte got married. In 1982, Charlotte's husband got imprisoned for a crime, and Emma was just a month old at the time. With no financial support and facing the challenges of being a single mother, Charlotte struggled to make ends meet. Yang Jianguo released from prison not long after Charlotte's husband went in, heard about Charlotte's situation from their common friends. He saw his chance. Through mutual connections, Yang Jianguo successfully connected with Charlotte, offering financial support through his small business. This made it hard for Charlotte to refuse. She moved Yang Jianguo into her home, and they started living together. Charlotte soon discovered that Yang Jianguo was a creature entirely ruled by his sexual desires. And having Charlotte wasn't enough for him. He watched pawns all the time, even with little Emma around. She was less than ten years old at the time. He even brought other women to their home for some messy business. Because of this, Charlotte had a few breakups with Yang Jianguo, even writing farewell letters at times. Each time, Yang Jianguo would repeatedly. Assured her that he wouldn't repeat his mistakes, and Charlotte would forgive him again and again. The two went through more than a decade of on again, off again, quarreling and making up. It wasn't until early 2001 that Charlotte fell seriously ill. Post illness, Charlotte wouldn't want to have sex anymore. You know, health wouldn't allow it. So Yang Jianguo. Who was already unsatisfied appeared to be even more eager on sex. His unmet desires turned him into an increasingly eerie and peculiar character. And remember, I said that Charlotte was short of cash, and so she didn't own a really big flat or anything. She had only one room for the three of them to stay in. Yang Jianguo couldn't really take much acts on Emma when the mother was. Always around, right? So, what would the monster do? As he couldn't take his eyes off the little girl, he noticed that Emma had a yearbook that she always kept next to her pillow. As for why he chose to attack Taylor's family first, it could be because of the name Taylor sounded too much like a girl, and it led to a misunderstanding. In the second case with Kathy, the girl was menstruating, and her mother was about to return home, so Yang Jianguo didn't get to assault her either. And let's don't forget about the failed attempt to Ava's mom. This guy was seriously ill in his mind. So why did he stop after the murder of Kathy? It could be that the meeting up of families and police scared him, made him worry about being exposed. Or it could be that he fell ill with cancer not long after that. Therefore, serious of treatments and stuff should weaken him to a point that his sexual desires died. We don't know the true answer to this question, do we? Since he was dead by the time the police was about to make the arrest. And to Emma and Charlotte, both of them claimed. They were oblivious to Yang Jianguo's crimes, right? But after Kathy's murder, they should have seen the suspect's sketch. Remember that the police held a parents and student meeting all together in the class, based on the vivid description by the remarkable、um, grocery store owner Bell. The drawn suspect looked almost identical to Yang Jianguo. Oh, you can see this is the sketch. This is how he looked like his photo. Even Ava's mom, a stranger, recognized him instantly. However, Emma and Charlotte, who spent day and night together with this man, failed to recognize him. With the、um, utmost malice, it really looks like that Charlotte and her daughter were trying to cover up for Yang Jianguo. 
when they realized the killer was someone close, they must feel really scared. But why wouldn't they feel sorry for all the victims? Especially Emma was classmate with Kathy. What do you think the reason for them to keep their mouth shut until the police had held um, solid evidence against Yang Jianguo? Two families of six were all gone. Now only Taylor is left alone. Fortunately, he finally survived the trauma, opened up to his wife, and they have children. In 2021, he went to his parents' graves and told them about the discovery of the real killer. Now they can both rest in peace, knowing the truth. Yang Jianguo's suicide brought an end to the case. However, the harm caused to those involved will never have a conclusion. And our story for the day ends here. Thanks for watching. I will see you in my next video.